Epilogue. The sound grew louder the deeper Jorgen went. It wasn't a buzzing, not like when he'd first met Spencer. He wasn't even certain it was a sound. Ned and Arturo couldn't hear it at all. Couldn't hear it after all. Maybe he was imagining it, but Jorgen could hear it. A soft music growing louder with each tunnel they had explored in the five days they'd been searching. They'd hit many dead ends and it and had to turn back a dozen times. But they were close now. So close he felt it was just beyond the wall here. He had to find a way to lead them left. He stumbled down a short incline, then waded through water that came up to his knees. He held his industrial strength lantern up before him, the kind used by the team to travel the distant tunnels and caverns of the planet to service remote equipment like pipes that carried up water from underground reservoirs. More water? Arturo asked from behind, his own lantern making Jorgen cast a long shadow. Jorgen, we really should get back. I could swear that sound we heard was an echo of the alarms. We might be under attack. All the more reason to keep going. He waded forward as the water grew deeper. He had to know what he was hearing, had to know if he was imagining things, or if, maybe, he could hear Detrius. That stupid, that seemed stupid when he thought about it like that. He hadn't told the others yet, except to explain he was on orders from Cobb, which he kind of was, after a fashion. And everyone believes I can't disobey orders, he thought. They don't think I can be brash, foolhardly, foolhardy, ha. Ah. <clears throat> running off into the deep caverns without proper supplies and only a couple of friends to accompany him, following a hunch and something he maybe, maybe thought he could hear, only no one else could. Jorgen, Ned asked, standing with Arturo at the edge of the water. Come on, we've been at this forever. Arturo is right. We really need to be getting back. It's right here, guys, Jorgen said, hip deep in water, a hand pressed against the stone wall. Songs, right here. We have to get through this wall. Okay, Arturo said. So we head back, see if anyone has mapped this section of the tunnels, and maybe determine if there's a good way to... Jorgen felt across the wall, noting that the water seemed to be flowing oddly. There's an opening here, just beneath the surface. It might be wide enough for me to wiggle through. No, Arturo said. Jorgen, do not try to squeeze through it. You'll get stuck and drown. Jorgen dropped his pack, letting his waterproof lantern float on the top of the pool. He reached down into, this wa into the water, filling out the break in the wall. It was wide enough. Spencer would try it, he said. Huh, Ned said. Is Spin really the best example to follow in acting stupid? Well, she does it all the time, Dorgan said, so she must have a lot of practice. Arturo rushed into the water, reaching for him, so before he could get talked or pulled out of going further, Dorgan took a deep breath and ducked under the surface, then kicked into the hole. He couldn't see in the water. His motions had stirred up silt, and so the lantern couldn't have helped either. He had to feel his way forward, grabbing the sides of the rock tunnel and pull himself through the dark water. Fortunately, it turned out that the tunnel wasn't long. It wasn't even really a tunnel, just a passage through the stone, maybe a meter and a half in length. He burst up into a dark cavern and immediately felt stupid. What did he expect to find or see in the darkness? He should have drowned. Then he heard the sounds, music all around him, flutes calling to him, the sound of the planet itself speaking. His eyes adjusted and he realized he could see. The stone here outside the small pool where he stood was overgrown with a blue-green luminescent kind of fungus. Indeed, much larger mushrooms were growing all across the floor of the cavern, perhaps feeding off nutrient-rich water dripping from an ancient pipe running along the wall. Hiding among, amid the mushrooms, fluting in a way he could now hear with both his mind and his ears, were a group of yellow creatures, slugs like Spence's pet, hundreds of them. I awoke to a soft breeze on my face. I blinked, disoriented, seeing white. I was back in that room with the Delver. No, I couldn't be. I... The room came into focus. I was in a bed with white sheets, but the walls weren't stark white, just a cream color. A window nearby looked out on the streets of Starsight, a soft breeze blowing in and ruffling the drapes. I was hooked up to tubes and monitors, and, and I was in a hospital. I sat up, trying to piece together how I'd gotten here. Ah, a familiar voice said, Spencer? I turned to find Kuna, wearing their official robes, peeking in through the door. My translator pen, fortunately, was clipped to my hospital robe. The doctor said you'd be waking, Kuna said. How do you feel? Explosive decompression nearly killed you. I'd recommend against going into space without a helmet in the future. It's been three days since the Delver incident. I, I touched my face, then felt at my throat. How did I survive? Kuna smiled, and actually, they were getting better at that. They settled down on a stool beside my bed, then got out, of their got out their tablet and projected a hollow image for me. It showed a shuttle flying down and landing on the docks inside Starsight. The city's shield went down, Kuna said, but emergency ES gravitation kept the atmosphere from escaping. 
Mortimer says you appeared in space once the Delver vanished, and they were quick-witted enough to grab you and pull you into their cockpit. I watched a projected Mortimer dock at Starsight, pop their canopy, then stand up, holding me, unconscious. They were met with cheers. I really was getting better at reading Dion expressions, because I immediately recognized the befuddlement on Mortimer's face. Mortimer thought everyone was going to be angry, didn't they? I said. They assumed they'd get in trouble for flying into battle. Yes, but for no reason, Kuna said. They swiped the hollow image to another. This one showed two Dion parents holding a small purple baby. I could see Mortimer's features in the parents, at least half of them on each face. It turns out, relatives who were advocating for a redraft changed their minds quickly once the draft became a celebrity. My culture has its first war hero in centuries. It will be a few years before Mortimer develops enough to enjoy the, their notoriety, though. I smiled and settled back into my pillow, feeling worn out, but not in pain. Whatever they'd done to heal me had been effective. Superiority medical technology was obviously beyond our own. I can't stay long, Kuna said. I need to speak at the hearings. Winsick, I asked, Braid. It's complicated, Kuna said. There is still some support for Winsick in the government, and there are conflicting accounts of the events a few days ago. Winsick is trying to claim that your people summoned the Delver, and a brave Dion, Morimer, was our salvation. However, I'm confident in my case. I've insisted on being allowed contact with your people. Always before, Winsick's people have been the only ones authorized to interact with the humans in the preserve. How surprised some of our officials were to get such calm, rational messages from your admirable, Admiral Cobb. This has proven that free humans aren't the ravening terrors that everyone expected. I think Winsick will be forced to step down, but it will help if you can speak to the press. I'm afraid I may have nudged the doctors to wake you early for that reason. It's all right. I'm glad that I bolted upright. Wait, and but. My ship, Kuna. I flew here on a ship that's very important. Where is it? Don't worry, Kuna said. Winsick's department raided your embassy after you fled the city, but I'm working to get all of your things restored to you. Your leader, Cobb, mentioned the ship specifically. I settled back, unable to shake a sick sense of worry for Embot. Still, I doubted that I could have hoped for a better outcome, all things considered. The Delver is really gone, I asked. So far as we can tell, Kuna said. Odd, as once they appear, they usually linger for years, causing mayhem. Whatever you did saved more than just Starsight. Plus, casualties were remarkably low for an event of this magnitude. Mortimer and Vapor explained what they could, though we're still uncertain about how exactly you dismissed it. I changed its perspective, I said. I showed it that we were people. Turns out it didn't want to destroy us. Kuna smiled again. Yes, they were getting good at that. It almost wasn't creepy. Something about the entire situation still put me on edge, but I forced myself to relax. We'd figure this out. It seemed the war might actually be over, or close to it. If the superiority was talking to Cobb, that was a huge step forward. And here I was, sitting in a superiority hospital without in my hologram on, and it was fine. I'd done it. Somehow, I'd actually done it. I smiled back at Kuna, then held out my hand. They took it. Hopefully, I could leave most of the details from here to the diplomats and politicians. My part was done. I closed my eyes and found that everything just felt wrong. I let go of Kuna's hand, then stood up, pulling the tubes from my arm. Spencer, Kuna asked, what is it? Where are my clothes? Your things are over on that shelf, Kuna said, but it's all right. You're, you are safe. I dressed anyway, putting on a laundered jumpsuit and flight jacket, then clipping on the translator pen. They left my bracelet, fortunately, which I snapped onto my wrist, even though I didn't need the hologram at the moment. I tried tapping it to contact Embot, but got no response. I stepped up by the window, still not quite certain what had, what had set me off. Part of it was abstract. Winsick had been willing to summon a Delver to fulfill his plots. It didn't feel like he would accept defeat like an honorable gener general, turning over his sword to his enemy. I scanned the city through the open window, standing just to the side of it so I wasn't silhouetted as a target. I'm being paranoid, aren't I? Perhaps you sh we should let you rest a little longer, Kuna said, their voice calm, but their fingers twitching in a sign of distress. I nearly agreed. Then I realized what the problem was, the thing that was setting me off, the thing my instincts had recognized, even if the rest of me hadn't put it together immediately. It was quiet. The window was open, and we were only three stories up, but there was no sound of traffic, no hum of people talking. Indeed, the streets outside were virtually empty. I was accustomed to noise on Starsight, people always crowding in on the street, movement everywhere. This city never slept, but today the streets were mostly empty. Was it just because everyone was upset and staying in following the Delver attack? No, I thought, spotting someone moving down a side street outside. 
a Dione in a brown striped outfit. I picked out two more of them ushering away a small group of civilians. Those people in the brown stripes, they looked exactly like the Dions I'd seen cleaning up after the protesters had been dealt with. They were the same ones who had exiled the gorilla alien. They're isolating the area, I realized, getting bystanders off the streets. This isn't over yet, I said to Kuna. We need to get out of here. 